Hi, thanks for joining us again on Celebrating Act Two. As you can see, Art Kirsch and I are with Hollywood historian Manny Pacheco. Manny, good to see you again. Good to see you guys again. You guys are looking good. Well, thank you. Yeah. As are you, youngster. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we get to chat about a whole bunch of things. Uh, I ran across an actor's name the other day who I vaguely knew, but I figured that if I want to know more about him, I mean, more than just the wikis have, is somebody that I, you don't hear with all the top names all the time. And maybe you can help us out. John Garfield. He was, he was a well-known actor, but I just yeah. don't know much about him. Yeah. Yeah. I think part of that is that he, I think at the time, Warner Brothers, uh, as other studios, were, were looking ahead to a new decade in the 1940s, and they were just looking for those new actors mm -hmm. that they could bring in to kind of complement the established stars like Gable and Tracy and Powell and Cooper and, and Bogart, and, and even Cagney and, and, and Robinson. And but John Garfield was one of those guys that came in at the same time as let's say Arthur Kennedy, although he was a bigger actor than Arthur Kennedy, uh, a, a, more of a, a romantic actor or leading actor than Robert than uh, than Arthur Kennedy. But others that came in at the same time, believe it or not, William Holden came in around that same time, around 1939, 1940. And they tried to bring in this new leading man. They weren't quite sure what to do with him. They put him in in, in a uh, a series of film called The Four Daughters which was kind of a delightful film with Claude Rains as the father of four, uh, four daughters, and each of them has a bow. And of course, the main daughter uh, would, would have uh, John Garfield as their bow. And, and so he, they tried to bring him in as a leading man, but it, it, as John pointed out before we got on, ca uh, got on camera here for the interview, um, he had kind of a more defined tough guy features. And so not sure what to do with him, the the first thing they do from the four daughters is they put him in a war film. They still want to make him a hero because he's a, obviously a good looking young man. And they put him in this movie called The Pride of the Marines, where he's blinded in action. And then he comes back home and has to learn to acclimate, even though he's suffered from this uh, affliction. And that was a big, big film. And quite frankly, I think it's the film that put him over the top, The Pride of the Marines. And I think he became a leading man at that point. But uh, and, and then, he, you know, again, he playing a hero. And, and John, you might want to speak why this is one of your favorite films. But the Sea Wolf with Ida Lupino and oh, uh, G. Robinson. Wonderful film. Again, he's the hero. It's Edward G. Robinson that's yep. the villain in this. And you like it. And you, and you see a hero there, right? Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, he had a quality. Garfield had a quality. By the way, I happen to be not that big a Garfield fan, but I do know his, his, he was born, I think, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And his original name was Garfinkel. Garfinkel, like, that's right. Yeah, Garfinkel. That's right. Um, but he had a quality that could look, he was a good looking guy. He wasn't particularly rugged features, but he he just had a strength in his face. He looked like a tough guy, but he could play a very soft guy. Mm -hmm. And what I love about Garfield is he always seemed to be a real person. He always seemed to be a regular guy. Yeah. And I think part of that is that because he was doing method acting before there was a thing called method, mm. he was actually preparing for mm. his roles in ways others did not. Mm. He tried to bring a realistic approach, even when he would play like the tough guy and they made me a criminal with the dead end kids. He let the dead end kids do all the caricatures and all the, the fun stuff. But he still came off as a real, you know, a real guy, a real guy as opposed to a character. Yeah. And of course, you know, he he would follow in the footsteps of, of of realistic actors like Edward G. Robinson and Cagney. I think they were very real in in the way they portrayed, but not in a method kind of way. What, the method was more that you you would play the part for a while and you would learn the part and try to understand who the character was as an actor. Yeah. You didn't just you know you just didn't punch in, do your lines, and then punch out. He really believed in that in that kind of a method that would later become a staple for Montgomery Cliff and Marlon Brando, and though he denies it, James Dean as well. I think he was a very big method. Paul Newman was a method guy as well. Sure. So, I mean, these were method actors who really believed. Daniel Day-Lewis is a modern-day method actor, just to give you reference there. But John Garfield would take on these roles where uh, even as a, I mean, he played a likable guy in Tortilla Flats, 
and uh, with Spencer Tracy, which, you know, you can learn a lot from Spencer Tracy, let me tell you. And he, he was one of the, th the third build kind of guys. He was always third build, much like Bogey was in the, in the 30s. And, uh, and then he, and he followed up with, um, I think, some really, really wonderful films. And by the time he made The Postman Always Rings Twice and Body and Soul, which for that latter film, he was nominated for Best Actor, by the way. Uh, he was now making films that really showcase his complete method persona, which was this really struggling to be tough, but really kind of a soft guy. I mean, he yeah. was very conflicted in the parts he played. You look at him in, in The Postman Always Rings Twice. He wants to be a good guy. Yeah. He doesn't want to commit murder, but he is just so... As a human being, he's just overtaken by the looks of Lana Turner. Oh, well, aren't we all? Yeah. I mean, hasn't she? She's never looked better than in The Postman Always Rings Twice. She's beautiful in that film. Yeah. And, and, he, and he could, in The Postman Rings Twice, he could project his regret and his, he knew he was being suckered in, and yet he knew he couldn't resist. That's and right. It's a wonderful, wonderful performance. Actually, everybody in, uh, in Postman Rings Twice is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hume Cronin is in it as well. Cecil Calloway. Yeah, yeah they're really, really good. And yeah, the, the, the name, the, the name of the actor who played the husband, Cecil uh, Calloway, who gets killed. Do you remember his name? C Cecil Calloway. But he was fabulous too. Yeah, yeah. He's he, a well-known character actor. But he yeah, you great. you'll remember him in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner when he plays the Monsignor. <laughs> He's just a likable Irish guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very, very nice guy. Very fun and very, very good actor. But oh, yeah. John Garfield would, 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 would now command really important roles. And along comes the, the plum of them all. You know, now you're nominated for an Oscar. What's right. going to come next? Gentleman's Agreement. And right. that's which is, by the way, which is the only picture I ever remember seeing him in. Uh, that's why I was saying he, he, he did such an amazing job. And yet... Um, it just his name is just relatively obscure to me. So yeah, yeah. He um he he was in this movie, and he asked and begged to be in this movie because um, John Garfield was Jewish, yeah. and he felt that the message was so important to share about uh, the the concept of anti-Semitism, which which really rang true for him. And yeah. so he begged into this movie, and because of the weight of the, the, the performances that he was making at that time, they brought him in. Now, the only problem with this is that many of the actors that were in the movie Body and Soul, Anne Revere and Canada Lee, um, these were all people, along with him, who had, prior to the war, uh, had, had joined the Communist Party. Uh -huh. And he was uh, then called upon the House on american Activities Committee and called to name names. And, of course, people like Canada Lee would uh, would die from the pressure of, of never being able to work and not naming names. Anne Revere never worked again. And John Garfield fought tooth and nail because in real life he really was a pretty active tough guy. He played tennis. He rode horseback. He was a pretty active guy. And he was young. He was only in his late 30s. But he fought, and he fought hard against the House on american Act. He was not going to name names. They kept him out of pictures for a while. He started doing his own productions of pictures. Mm. And all of that work took its toll. And in 1952, at the age of 39, 39, wow. he suffered a heart attack and he died. I can wow. only imagine what his films in the 1950s would have been during, wow. during the height of the method uh, way of, of acting. I think his best work was was ahead of him. I think he would have been, I mean, like one of the all-time great actors instead of a, a footnote, which is really, really a shame. So you know, it's kind of interesting. The fact that he died, the fact that he died at the age of thirty-nine. Matt, thank you for that because uh, uh, I hadn't looked it up. Yeah. That ex probably explains why he had a great reputation, but. He hardly had uh, any legs in uh, movies. And, and he probably would have, uh, uh, like you said, after the 50s scare was over and things like that, probably would have uh, gone yeah. on to make many, many more movies and, and yeah. be remembered for uh, a much bigger personality and star than he was, 
uh, was uh, that I recall. I really think so. I, I honestly do. And John, mm -hmm. what were you going to say? I, I was just asking if technically he was blacklisted or because he refused to name names, or did he just not get uh, put on I the think, blacklist? I think, and, it gets pretty, I think it gets pretty sad at this point, mm -hmm. because at one point or another, for whatever reason, he gets exonerated, but he gets exonerated days before he dies. Wow. So the pressure from all that was going on, and, and then there were reports that he played tennis on a very, very hot day on the day he died. He was just, he had nothing else to do. So he'd go out and play tennis, or he'd just try to, he'd try to hmm. hide, he tried, he was one of those strong, silent types, so he would kind of hide his emotions. And I just, I just think it took a toll on him. I think it aged him. I think that, um, I think he, if he was exonerated, chances are in 1953, 1954, and beyond, he would have made terrific movies. Look what happens to another actor, Lee J. Cobb, another actor that did not want to name names. And he was going hungry, and his wife was going hungry, and their kids were going hungry, and he suffers a heart attack. He suffers a heart attack because of the strain put on by the House on american Activities Committee. Yeah. And who, who comes to bail him out? Frank Sinatra. What he does is he puts him into his little home in his retreat in Palm Springs, and he nourishes him back to health. And after all of that, Lee, Lee J. Cobb finally said, I had enough. I, I'll name a name or two. You know, yeah. I, and he finally does. I mean, he's really forced to because he, he wants to protect his family. He knows that he will die if he, if he doesn't do something. Yeah. And, and what, what follows there, and this, now think of this in terms of, of, of John Garfield. What follows after he does that on the waterfront, 12 Angry Men, sure. Exodus. So you can, you, can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine the kind of roles Garfield would have gotten. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. He would have gotten a lot of the roles that probably then went to Frank Sinatra. Interesting. I think he had, I think he had a lot of roles in him that, that could have gone to him that went to Frank Sinatra, maybe Marlon Brando. Yeah. I think those kinds of roles... Yes, it's always the question, what would what if James Dean would have done? Well, what would a John Garfield would have done? Maybe James Dean doesn't exist because of John Garfield, because maybe John Garfield does East of Eden. You know, mm -hmm. maybe he does Giant. Yeah. So that's the question you got to ask, and those what-if questions can never be answered. You just, they're, they're, those are questions made for programs like this. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's exactly what those well, are. Well, what a fascinating, what a fascinating take on this guy. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Appreciate it. Well, let's just say that uh, John Garfield, we have him alive in films, and that for that we can be grateful. So, For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.